So um, every couple of weeks, I, I, I walk into the gym and go in the locker room, and I'm greeted by a healthy dose of these little business card-sized evangelism cards. They've got them, you know, around the sink and on the tops of the urinals. I mean, you know, when you're a you know, captive audience, right? And, uh, and basically, the card is, is Romans 6.23. Uh, half of that verse, depending on which way you're looking at it, uh, the wages of sin is death, and then on the other side, the gift of God is eternal life. Very clever, huh? But kind of in your face, right? Um, this week, I decided to take a very different tack. Uh, I took over our door hangers. I asked permission to um, litter the, the gym with these guys from the, from the front desk all the way into the restrooms. And, and instead of us kind of standing on street corners, you know, yelling with, with megaphones to people walking into and out of bars and abortion centers that, you know, you're going to hell, we're throwing a party. Um, instead of kind of, you know, knocking on doors and ask people if they know where they're going if they die tonight, we purchased 1,600 pumpkins and we've got free food and events. It's going to be a wonderful afternoon. That's not, not to say that we don't ever talk about Jesus or the reality of, of sin and hell and death. We just take a different tack. It's the path of the incarnation. It's the path our Savior took, Jesus, when he stepped out of heaven and became flesh. The word became flesh and dwelled among us. It moved into our neighborhood full of grace and truth. And for the past four weeks, we've delved pretty deep into how we can put flesh on the body of Christ, that we're not just people who gather to worship, but how we can go out and live incarnationally in the world. Uh, develop relationships and a reputation of, of people who, who listen and love and bless, people who have conversations with, with people who are far from God and allow the Holy Spirit to take the lead. Instead of us trying to judge or condemn or, or push them into some conversation, it's about allowing, just showing up and, and them saying something's different about him. What is it about her? I want to know more. And when they ask, then, when they ask, we're ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. Today, we're tying a ribbon around this series and bringing it back full circle, not focusing on those now outside the church, but on those of us inside the church, those of us who've already crossed the line of faith and asked Jesus to be our Savior. Because once we figure out how we keep growing in Christ and becoming more like him, then we'll know how to prepare others who've crossed that line, who've been confronted with their sin. They, they ask for that and how they can continue to grow and how we can come alongside them. Listen, if you have questions, if you're new here, we welcome your questions. Take out your phone, text them in. At the end of the message, I'll uh, try to answer. The, the, the number is on the screen in the venue as, as well as here in the auditorium. It's also in your bulletin. So let's begin with a reminder about just why Jesus came to earth, okay? Why did God step out of heaven and put on human flesh? The incarnation wasn't just about Jesus coming down and dying to take us back to heaven, but also to transform us here on earth, to transform our life right here, right now. Certainly, Jesus came to live a perfect life, then offer that life back to the heavenly Father as a payment, as an atonement for our sins. He did that. Why? Because we couldn't. We're just incapable of living a perfect life. And what's more, if, if we spent all of our time, you know, before Jesus, I mean, so much of, of life was when you sin, you go to the temple or you go to the synagogue, you make, a, you make a sacrifice, you make an offering. And Jesus made a one-time sacrifice. So we're not continually going back to God and what do I have to do? And what, here's my offering, here's my sacrifice to get right with God. We know that we've been forgiven in Christ. We confess our sin, we're set free. It gives us a whole lot more time to spread his good news. So Jesus came to set us free from that sacrificial system. It's by his grace that we've been saved. He came and died on the cross, absolutely. So nothing could separate us from God's love, now or eternally. <clears throat> but he also came that we might have abundant life here on earth. 
Jesus said, it's the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, he said, to give you life abundant to its fullest measure. That when we choose to die to ourselves and ask Jesus to be our Savior and Lord, we can begin to live with the blessings of heaven right now. Here's how the Apostle Paul said it in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The question is, how do we get there? How do we get to where Paul is, where we want to live, where we've died to ourselves? and we're living fully for Christ. Because quite honestly, Paul's story is pretty unique. His transformation story is kind of almost one of a kind, even for that day. You remember Paul's story. So Paul was actually this guy named Saul. He was a Pharisee, kind of chief among all the Pharisees. He absolutely hated Jews who were selling out to this, this sect called Jesus followers, the followers of the way. In fact, he made it his primary mission in life to go and round up as many of these followers of the way as possible and persecute them. It was on one such mission that Paul was going on the road to Damascus when all of a sudden the, the Jesus, who had been crucified, raised from the dead, this Jesus meets and confronts Paul. And this shining light, this booming voice from heaven, and, and, and Paul is blinded. He's blinded for three days. He goes to the next town, and, and the Holy Spirit sends a Jesus follower to minister to Saul. And, and Saul's eyes then get opened, the scales fall away, and he has this radical, just radical change in life. In, in, instead of being Saul, his name gets changed to Paul. Instead of persecuting the church, he actually goes out and begins to promote the church. Becomes the greatest evangelist the church has ever known. Started churches left and right. Wrote all kinds of letters to minister to these churches. Letters that, that have now been gathered up and actually compose about two-thirds of our New Testament. So, Jesus doesn't usually work like that. Even in those days, I mean, showing up on a road, bright light, booming voice, I wanted that when I was, you know, being called to the ministry, hey, show me something, God, you know, hey, part the clouds, let me see the light. It turned out it was a car coming straight at me and it was, you know, kind of scary, but, you know, the same holds true today. Not many of us have been kind of called and confronted with, with Christ in, in that kind of dramatic scenario. Most of us who are Jesus followers have made that decision as a result of, of, of being confronted with, with something in our life where things didn't go the way we had planned. And, and all of a sudden, you know, we reach out and we begin to look for answers, maybe Maybe uh, we pick up our Bible or, or, or maybe we ask a friend or, or whatever. We, we, we get back to, to church. And, and, and most of us, when we, we get to that point of change, it's not about somebody else coming in and telling us that, that we're wrong. We need to, to do better and be better. It's almost always an internal decision to change. Transformation is triggered it is initiated, catalyzed by this internal desire to change. You know you've been drinking too much. You know you should be doing something, but you don't do anything. You don't decide to reach out for help until that officer pulls you over and you get arrested with a DUI. You've always wanted to eat better and exercise, but you thought, oh, I'll just keep putting that off until the doctor tells you, hey, Brother, you're 60 pounds overweight and you're a heart attack waiting to happen. You take one look at your picture of your grandkids and you decide to turn your ship around. You're prone to procrastinating your homework, young people. You put that off and put that off and it's three weeks before grades turned in. You go online and see that you're carrying two Fs and a D. You decide maybe it's a good time to start uh, going home and studying instead of playing that Xbox for five hours every night. 
See, that's how it happens with faith too, friends. Jesus might have some good teachings. You know, there's certainly a, a great idea about this eternal life thing out there that he offers, but, but you'll put that off. That's not for now. There's too much living to be had. But when the bottom falls out of some area of your life, it's then that you make the decision. You personally decide to make Jesus a part of your life. Here's how that often works. Hugh Halter calls it the two decisions, a first and a second decision Christian. I want to talk about it in terms of the two stages of transformation. If we want to go from being just normal human people to the people that God created us to be, to be transformed, I believe there's two stages that happens in. And the first is that one-time moment of salvation. This is when we realize the weight of our sin. We realize that we can't do anything about our sin, that we're helpless in that sin, that we need a higher power. We need God. We need Jesus who paid his life as an atonement for our sins. Our slate gets wiped clean. Maybe, maybe for you that was at a vacation Bible school or a youth camp. Maybe you made that decision because you were searching for answers. You were looking for, for purpose in life. Is this really all there is to this life? And Maybe somebody handed you a copy of Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life, or maybe you went to the closet and you found your, your Bible and you dusted it off and you began reading it. Whatever the catalyst, you accepted the grace of God. You were born again, and you began walking with Jesus. But not soon after, you realize that while you were born again, you still weren't perfect, right? Right? We get that realization, all of a sudden we come to Jesus and it feels great and wonderful and things are going well, and then it's like, you know, whew, it, it, it's not all just, you know, Barney and, and, and you know, the Barney song and Kumbaya, and there, there's some struggles and strifes. I'm still tempted by the, the same things I was tempted by before. Some of those old sins are, are continuing to knock and, and creep back into my life. Why? Because on this side of eternity, we're probably not made perfect. And while we were given a fresh start and our sins were wiped clean, we still had work to be done in our life. So there's that first stage of transformation. And that first stage is, is when we make that one-time commitment and receive Jesus as our Savior. But there's a second stage of transformation. And then unlike the one-time moment, this is an ongoing process, the ongoing work of sanctification. Crossing the line of, of faith and asking Jesus to be your savior is something we only need to do once. Some of you grew up in denominations where you had to keep getting saved every week. You were baptized 14 times before it finally took. We asked Jesus to be our savior one time. And even though our heart might have not been fully in it, you know, God's was. And even though we backslide, we always backslide. God's grace is there still for us. But making him more than Savior, making him Lord of every area of our life, it takes time. Here's what Hugh Halter writes in his book, Flesh. He says, the incarnation isn't just about reaching other people. That's maybe about 2% of what the whole thing is about. Most of the incarnation is about God breaking into darkness to bring light to humankind. The type of light that brings life, or as Jesus said, life to its fullest measure. Conversion, he says, is a starting point. Yep, but transformation is the full heart of the incarnation. It's about people, including those of us who are already having faith, going to the light of Jesus and having our lives continually turned upside down for their own good. Now, for me, I'm a visual learner. And so I've tried to explain this before and actually asked for this kind of graphic to be uh, created to help us, help us hopefully conceptualize the, the two movements, the two stages of transformation. And this, this first is kind of like Jesus is out there and here's our life. And you might have 
10 boxes, but you know, the, you know, we got our family bucket, our career bucket, our finances, friends, free time, our health, just keep adding buckets. So when we ask Jesus to be our savior, here's what happens. Jesus comes and he becomes one of those segments of our life. That's usually what happens. Maybe Jesus even becomes first place in our life. And we think, hey, there you are. But there's a second work, a second step. And the second step is when Jesus not only moves into our life and becomes on the same level, maybe first place, but on the same level of of the rest, that he actually moves down and becomes foundational. Where your relationship, your identity with Jesus begins to inform every area of your life. That your relationship as a Jesus follower influences how you look at your body as the temple of God. It influences the way that you... spend your free time. It influences the friends that you choose to have, the way you spend your time, your talent, your treasure, the way you kind of do time and your priorities and values as a family. Jesus comes not just into your life and becomes a part of your life, but he actually becomes the foundation that helps us grow. And, 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 And as we become, ask Jesus to be our Lord, it's about that idea of moving from unbelief to belief in every area of our life. So we're gonna spend the rest of our time this morning talking about how that actually happens, how this transformation, what that looks like in our own life. We're gonna look at two verses that the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans. The New Testament book of Romans is actually the first letter that you'll encounter of Paul's in the New Testament. You have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then you have the Acts of the Apostles, better title, Acts of the Holy Spirit, because it was the Holy Spirit doing the work through the Apostles. Then you get to the book of Romans. But even though it's the first book of Paul's, letter of Paul, that, that we actually encounter, Romans was written last. It was like Paul's manifesto of the Christian faith. After after years of being in the game as as a seasoned preacher and teacher, one who was teaching the Christian faith, but also living the Christian faith, Paul says, here's what I want you to know. Here's what I've learned as I've preached, as I've taught, as I've lived this kind of life, as I've struggled with adversity time and time again, here's what I want you to know, that you might have that same peace and joy that I've come to know, that Christ is truly in charge, not just knowing him, but really surrendering, surrendering every area of my life. He says, I know what it is like. I know what it's like to, to be content. I know what it's like to, to have plenty, to have nothing, to be well-fed, to be hungry. In all things, Christ Jesus is sufficient. So Paul's writing, you know, this kind of last final challenge in word. And and here's what he says in in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true act of worship. It's not about going and offering animals anymore. It's not about a couple turtle doves or a bull or a goat to pay for your sins. Jesus did that. So now what God wants, he wants more than just that animal. He wants more than just your money. He wants your life. Offer your life, your body as a living sacrifice. He says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed By the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve of what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Let's talk about three transformational non-negotiables. If we're going to be transformed from who we've kind of grown up and kind of are into who God wants us to be, who he created and destined you to be, the plan he has, the purpose that he has for your life, the reason he took the time to cre- create you unique and special, here's what, it's gonna, here's what it's gonna look like. Here's what's gonna need to happen that we're gonna have to lay hold of. And the first thing is surrendering our will. I don't know about you, but God not only gave me the gift of free will that I get to make my choices, that God's not, you know, I'm not some robot who's just kind of been doing what God's already programmed. God's given me the gift of free will, but man, God's given me something that, that oftentimes is a curse, the, the curse of a strong will. Any of your spouses have that? 
Yeah, several of you, right? You know, I, I, man, I, I love kind of, you know, char- love making my decisions and to be in charge. I love my title, lead pastor. I work and study hard, and my way is usually a pretty doggone good way, effective and efficient. I literally have to pull back the reins. I mean, I jump out of bed and, you know, I don't even require coffee. I'm ready to charge into the day, but, but I have to kind of pull back the reins in order to, to really put God first in my life. Because of my strong will, because of my pull up your bootstraps, let's just jump in and take that hill, my quiet time, my daily devotional continues to be a struggle for me. I mean, to make that happen, I literally have to go onto my calendar. You can pull up my outlook and you see every morning after I drop off my son at school, God, that's my appointment. That's a hard one to skip out on, you know? I can miss other meetings, but man, when your meeting says God, I have to do that because I have to tell myself, surrendering my will and taking this time to spend with God, I've got too much going on today. There's no way, there's no way, Mike, you really plan to get all this done. The only way it's going to happen is if you put God first. Bill Hybels wrote a book entitled, Too Busy Not to Pray. I, I, I tend to remember that. I got so much going on that if I try to do it in my own time and my own will and my own power, I'm going to blow it. But if I put God first, he's going to somehow be in every area and every appointment and every task. And somehow they're going to go better. They're going to go a little quicker. Some of the things that I don't really need to do, those are just going to kind of magically disappear. And, And with God, a whole lot more things are possible than just with Mike. What is it? What is it that you find difficult surrendering your will to? Is it about giving him control of your free time? You've got a a hobby that you dearly love, and there's nothing wrong with hobbies, and there's nothing wrong with going out and having fun, but but is your, your hobby dominating your life? Is it a distraction from what God really wants to do in your life? Is your free time dominated by that to to the exclusion of ever serving others? What about your finances? Of is that something you're still not surrendering to him? Maybe it's your, your pride. Or maybe it's a habit or an addiction that continues to wreak havoc in your own health and your own family. Young people, are you surrendering your choice of the, the folks that you tend to hang around with? Are you, are you giving that to God? Are you looking at the people that you're choosing to date? Are you judging who you date based on how good looking someone is or, or what kind of job or how much money they make? Are you saying, God, I'm going to let you guide me to the person? I'm going to look to you, and I'm going to wait. Instead of going with the the dominant flow of culture and look for the best looking, the tallest, handsomest, or whatever, I'm going to really look and let you, God, show me somebody who who loves you, who shares my values as a follower of Jesus, who will treasure me as much as you treasure me. Hey, the first part of transformation It's taken our strong will and beginning to submit that, to surrender that. And listen, it's not a one-time deal. You do that when you receive Jesus as your Savior, but you have to do it. I have to do it every single day, right? So surrendering our will every day if we want to be transformed in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. The second thing is renewing our mind. I've been talking the last couple weeks about this conference that we went to down in Atlanta a couple weeks ago, and a fascinating uh, speaker that I I got to hear in a preliminary breakout session, and then she also presented in one of the main sessions. Her name is Dr. Caroline Leaf, and she's actually written a book, How to Switch on Your Brain. She's a neuroscientist, so she's like six pay grades above me intellectually, right? And she talks like five times faster than me. I mean, that's, this lady is just, you're like, give her an oxygen tank. I think she just kind of, you know, has it right in, you know, intravenously because she never breathes. She's just, and and, and yet one of the things that she told me that's just fascinating is that, that our thoughts are real. Now listen, I'm talking like our thoughts are real matter. You know, submicroscopically, in, on, a, on a subcellular level, they are able to go in with these images and they can see thoughts forming, thoughts growing. Thoughts literally are 
real, tangible matter. They can discern between healthy thoughts and unhealthy thoughts, positive thoughts and, and negative thoughts. And what's more, we have the ability to stop negative thoughts from growing and multiplying. How do we do this? By feeding our brain good thoughts, by putting good things. We can literally, as, as, as Paul says, renew your mind, the transformation. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What Solomon wrote thousands of years ago, as a man thinketh, so he is, is literally scientifically true. So what are you putting in to your mind? What's going through your filter every day? On your smart device, what are all the emails? What's all the YouTube, the Instagram, the Facebook? What's coming in to your life? What are you choosing to watch on TV? What are you choosing to look at on the internet? What are you listening to on the radio? Friends, this is why it's so important that we're in God's word on a daily basis, that we're reading his word, that we're memorizing his word, so that when we're out there, um, before, uh, right before, right before this, this sermon, I, as you can tell, I'm struggling with my voice, have been for, for all week. God's going to get me through this. Man, before I went into my, I had a little closet in my office. I pulled the doors closed and I sat down and I just began to just quote scriptures. My God is able to meet all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. God is able to do immeasurably more than I could ever ask or imagine according to his power within me. By his stripes, I am healed. Friends, when we begin to feed ourselves good thoughts, godly thoughts, we can renew our mind. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future filled with hope. Hey, if you want to be transformed to become everything that God has created you to do, if you want to be able to take on the adversity and know that you can step out and you can speak and God is going to show up there and he's going to give you exactly what you need, My voice is going to crash this afternoon, but my God's going to give me everything I need to get through this day. Are you renewing your mind with the word of God? If you want to be transformed, you got to surrender your will on a daily basis. It's about renewing your mind with the scripture. And finally, it's about living in community. It's about living in community. We need one another. This past week, I had the blessing of sitting down with a guy who's, who's literally only been coming to the church for, for I think, a week. Um, he was referred to by, by, a, by a friend who said, you know what, it would be really good for you to go and, and, and seek out a church. And you know what, I want to recommend a church, Morningstar Church. And, and, and the truth of the matter is that this guy grew up, he grew up going to church um, many years of his life. He kind of gotten out of that. Um, He's read the Bible, he told me, four times, so he knows the word of God. But his wife is working overseas, and and what he needs more than anything are relationships. He needs community. He says, I'm desperate for fellowship. And so I'm like, you couldn't have come to Morningstar at a better time. I mean, he's already connected to a small group. He's serving at the Great Pumpkin Festival and considering coming to the men's event tomorrow night right over here in the venue. See, friends, God wired us, God created us in his image, male and female. And who is God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The God who exists in community wired us up in communi- for community. We simply need one another. And there's two, I think, two aspects of this community, this team that God has created for us to do life with. And the first is the community of the Holy Spirit that Holy Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the community of the Holy Spirit. Because listen, God knows there's a part, there's an aspect of our change, of the transformation that he wants to do in us that's beyond anything that any human can do. I mean, there's a part of of faith that's just mysterious and miraculous and plain old supernatural. 
that God's going to do what only God can do. When we go in and pray with people before surgery, we ask God to bless the, the doctors and the, the, the surgeons, the nurses, the anesthetologists, everybody, right? But we say, God, we ask for you to do what only you can do because there's a place at which human smarts. I mean, we've got neuroscientists that are on the cutting edge that are just now beginning to figure out what God put in his word thousands of years ago. So we need God doing stuff in our life that only God is able to do. Paul says it like this in 2 Thessalonians. He says, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Jesus said it like this a few years earlier. He said, but when he, the Holy Spirit, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears from the Father and he will tell you what is yet to come. See, when the Holy Spirit, when we cross that line of faith, we make that first decision to be saved. Jesus sends his Holy Spirit into us. Why? To equip us with what we're going to need for that ongoing work of growing more perfect in love of God and neighbor, more perfect in the image of Jesus Christ. He gives us his Holy Spirit, but God gives us something else. He makes another provision for us in community. And it's this. It's not worship. It's one another. It, it's, it's church. That we simply need one another. Look at what the author of the New Testament book of Hebrews writes. Now, we don't know who wrote Hebrews necessarily. People have, have kind of made some educated guesses there. But what we know is that the community that the author was writing to, the, the community that Hebrews was written to, were struggling um, there was persecution going on. Many of them who had converted to Christianity were beginning to backslide. They were beginning to, to kind of go back to Judaism. They were going back to practicing the law of Moses. And, and they were waiting for Jesus to come back. And Jesus hadn't come back, you know, in, in a couple, you know, he'd come and say, you know, hey, there's not going to be a generation that passes away. And, and that generation passed. And they're like, well, what's going on here? Did we get that wrong? Did they write that down wrong? And so they began sliding back. And so the author is writing words of encouragement to them in the midst of this kind of persecution and this kind of backsliding. Here's what he says. He says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more encouraging one another as you see the day of the Lord, his return approaching. Friends, it's in the church that we find models and mentors that can can partner with us and help us mature. It's in the church that we have a safe place where we can, we can get and receive encouragement. It's a safe place where we can speak the truth in love to one another, and we can have other people speak the truth in love to us. It's a place where we can be real, where we can confess our sins, where we can learn how to give and receive forgiveness. We need the Holy Spirit, and we need the church to be able to mature. I've got one question, I'm gonna answer that and we're gonna close. I feel I'm still learning and when I go to talk about Jesus, I feel I won't know enough or have the right answers. What can I do? Memorize the whole Bible, go to seminary and then get a graduate degree. And then you will still feel like I do, inadequate to answer every question. The hardest thing about deciding to uh, to do text questions wasn't the technology to get the questions down here. It was my fear that somebody was going to ask a question that I didn't know about. Imagine that, you guys smarter than me. Huh? How stupid am I? You know, there's a couple things, and, and this is where I just think we have to put our trust in the Holy Spirit, that God equips us with the Holy Spirit. I think a couple things. First of all, if we're letting them do the asking, we're not trying to push something on. They're asking us, and they're asking us based on the way that we've lived as an authentic life. We can trust that when that time comes, 
God truly is going to give us the words that we need for that person. It's not going to be a seminary dissertation. You're not going to get an A in systematic theology. But a lot of my messages are just kind of just a bunch of, ugh. And sometimes even the, the, the messages that I think are kind of the worst are the ones that people come up and say, man, that just, that kind of hit me. I'm like, are you kidding? Last week was awesome. Should have come up last week. Because, because see, something happens when we're in Christ and, and, and the Holy Spirit is in us. He, he's able to give us, and, and not only just our, the words, but he's able to, there's something that happens between here, what we speak, and, and their ear, that he, he just is able to direct those right to the heart. And, um, and so if we're surrendered to him, we're, we're able to, to speak those words. And the other thing is, the other thing is, most people are not going to be convinced by words. They're going to be convinced by your heart. They're not so much just listening to what we say, but we're look, they're, look, they're watching how we say it. Are we coming at them like, we've got this truth, thank you for finally asking me, I just thought you'd never do it, no, let me unload on you, or... Or we're stepping down. We talked about that last week. When somebody asks, our first step into that conversation is a step down to be humble. And when we say, brother, I got to be honest with you. I'm, you know, I'm not qualified to have this conversation, but here's what I know. Here's how Jesus has shown up in my life. And when you're speaking, not, you know, just quoting Bible verses, but when you're speaking about what Jesus has done in your life, nobody can take that away, right? That's your story. It's been your experience. They can't argue with that. Um, and so be humble, trust in the Holy Spirit, say it with, with love, and then share from your own perspective, your own point of view. Hey, you know what? Going to the gym and signing up for a membership is easy. Man, it takes like less than five minutes. I mean, all you have to do is go out, fill out a little form, give them your debit card or your, or your, uh, or your credit card so they can take it out every single month. Signing up and becoming a member at the gym is easy. But it takes commitment to get up every day and go there and put in the time and put in the energy because there's days you just don't feel like it, feel like you got other things that are more important, better to do. It helps to kind of have, you know, a, a, an in. It helps to have friends and who, who are going to go and, and, and work out kind of with us. Same way with improving every area of our life. It's easy. It is so easy to make all kinds of bargains with God when life gets tough, to make decisions, and I'm going to sell out, and I'm going to receive you as my Savior, Jesus. But listen, but listen, making him our Lord is a lot more difficult. It's a daily decision to die to self so that God would not just exist out here. Christ would not exist out here, not be just on the, the level of everything else, but actually become foundational in our life. Many of you might have come to Christ in one of those Hail, Hail Mary, difficult life situations, but then something happened. Perhaps the season of strife subsided, and with it, your commitment to Christ. Hugh Halter writes this. He says, the, the, starting the work of incarnation is fun, but finishing the work of in, incarnation is formidable. He continues with these words, the first and second decision language. He says, first decision, folks, take the wide road. Second decision, followers, choose the narrow road. First decision, humans play it safe. They avoid the real world and wait for God's kingdom to come back. Second decision, apprentices, take risk, become natives, and make his kingdom tangible now. First decision, people flow to the currents of what the dominant culture dictates. But second decision, leaders, Intentionally create and hold one another to the counter-cultural cadences of kingdom life. My, my brothers and sisters, my challenge to you on this last week of flesh is to lean in. To lean in. Trust God that he who began a good work in you will indeed carry it on to completion. He's got a plan for you. He's got a purpose just for you. He started a good work in you, but it's not finished. 
And it's going to require the Holy Spirit, and he's given you that. But it's also going to require you surrendering your will, committing to renewing your mind and belonging and living life in community. When things get difficult, don't throw in the towel. Likewise, when the pressure of life begins to subside, friends, don't slide back into just a casual relationship where Jesus is my Savior and I've got my ticket to heaven. Press on toward the life that really is life. As Paul says, press on to win the upward the prize to which God has called you heavenly word in Christ Jesus. Press on. Don't give up. Make Jesus Lord, not just of your life, but of every area of your life. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. You indeed give us exactly what we need exactly when we need it. You're a God of abundance and grace. Father, um, I thank you for the opportunity to get into your word today, to know your word and to put trust in your word that you, God, are faithful, that what you promised for hundreds of years, you sent your son, Jesus. At the fullness of time, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. God, you did for us in Christ what we could not do for ourselves. You made an atonement, a payment for our sins by living a perfect life. God, we say thank you for that. We again recommit our, our, our level of gratitude for, for what you've done for us in Christ. But God, help us to not be settled that Jesus is, is just our Savior. But God, help us to, to desire deeply change, to become who you've created us to be, to make him Lord of our life, to commit to the process every day for the rest of our life. And when we backslide, to get back in the saddle the next day and not let the enemy have a foothold. And tell us we failed and we'll, we'll not be forgiven. God, your grace by your stripes were healed. Father, if there's a person here today in the auditorium or maybe over in the venue, if you're here today and you haven't made that first decision, I invite you to say right now to make Jesus your Savior. Father, forgive me of my sin. I receive the grace of Jesus Christ. His death is an offering for my sin. And now, God, begin to fill me with the power and presence of your Holy Spirit so that you would guide me into all truth to know how to lay myself down every day, to renew my mind, and to do life in community with your Holy Spirit in this church. Hey, if you've prayed that prayer, we celebrate that, and we stack hands together, and we say amen, amen.